Headliner Nation. Welcome back to the Fantasy Headliners. Kyle here to talk about some breakout players for 2020, but more specifically, third-year breakout players. Now, why do I want to talk about third-year breakout players? This is a year that can be make or break for a lot of guys. When you get into that third year, if you really haven't put together a full season that at least shows us some of that ceiling you potentially have, people can start to back away a little bit and say, if it hasn't happened by now, there's a good chance that it won't happen. So for this year, I've got several guys that really are kind of looking at needing that breakout type season. And I got another guy that kind of already broke out, but there is a ceiling there that is a lot higher that we could see that he could potentially reach this season. But do me a favor, Headliner Nation, before we go forward with all that information, scroll down just a tad and hit that like button for me and also leave me a comment at some point in this video. Comment with your breakout player for this year, a third year breakout player. It could be somebody on this video that you agree or disagree with or another guy that I didn't talk about that you think it is his season. So let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you are new to the channel, this is your first video with us, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and stick around, become a part of Headliner Nation today, and see all the great content that we are pumping out daily on this channel. Without further ado, we gotta jump into quarterbacks now. And I've got two quarterbacks I'm taking a look at this season heading into their third year. Now, one of those guys is the one that I mentioned. He's kind of already had that breakout, but there's so much more ceiling there. This is the year where we could really say this guy becomes a star in the NFL and another guy who just did not reach expectations last year. And I'm talking about Josh Allen and Baker Mayfield. Now, the numbers, they go back and forth a little bit. You know, Baker Mayfield beat Josh Allen last year in passing yards, in touchdowns, and completion percentage. But Josh Allen was way, way ahead of Baker Mayfield when it came to the interceptions. Only nine interceptions for Josh Allen last year, which is excellent, considering one of the issues with Josh Allen was concern over his accuracy. So he took a little bit of that step forward last year. But that huge ceiling that is out there for him, can it be another step forward? For Baker Mayfield, we like to call him the Bake Show around here, but he wasn't really the Bake Show last year. That's why he's the Bake Sale this year, because you can get him at such a discount, and he's got so many weapons around him. But let's do this. Let's talk about Josh Allen first, and this is a guy I got to give some props to. I was, I was super hard on Josh Allen coming out of the draft. I would have much rather have seen him go to someone like the New England Patriots, where he could have sat for a couple of years, learned, worked on his mechanics, worked on some of that inconsistencies that we've seen from him behind Tom Brady, and then stepped in to become the starter. When he went to Buffalo, I was worried that they would try and force him into a role. And when they did in his rookie season, you could see those inconsistencies. However, last year, again, he did take a step forward, and there's more improvements ahead for him potentially. Last year, he dropped that interception percentage from 3.8% in 2018 down to 2% in 2019. That is one thing that I definitely loved to see. Now, the completion percentage, yeah, we would rather see that hit 60%, 61, 62, 63%, I think would be a huge leap for him this year. It's those intermediate routes that can be a little inconsistent for him, where he'll overthrow guys or throw behind him, those slants over the middle of the field when you really have to lead your receiver and he'll get it behind those guys and they have to either turn to make the catch and they can't really pick up a whole lot of yards after the catch or it gets thrown behind him or they get a little bit scattered because they know that a, a defender is coming very close to them and they don't end up making the catch. So We've got to get better at that point. That's where Josh Allen can really excel and take another step forward. We know he has the ability to go deep. Okay, We know that with Stephon Diggs and John Brown there, this is an offense that could score at any point in time. But it's those drives where you've got your wide receivers locked down deep and you're really not having the deep ball passing that day that you have to be able to make those intermediate throws. And that's where Josh Allen can really reach some of that upside this season 
And it's his rushing ability that really helps with that upside as well. And that's why for fantasy football owners, Josh Allen is a guy a lot of people want to invest in this year. His rushing upside last season was excellent. 109 rushing attempts was second. His 510 rushing yards was third. And his nine rushing touchdowns was first. This is a guy that is kind of like that goal line back with the Buffalo Bills. Because all nine of his touchdowns last year came from inside the red zone. He was the guy when they're at the goal line, they're inside the 20. If they run any plays running the football, Josh Allen is going to see some touches. And who knows? Maybe he can bump those rushing touchdowns. If he can duplicate nine and possibly even get to 10, that is doable because, again, you have John Brown and Stefan Diggs there that are really going to stretch the field. And when you've got defenders running deep trying to keep up with those guys, it can leave some room to run for Josh Allen. So he could still see a lot of that upside from the rushing standpoint this year. And, again, if he can make that move forward, those intermediate routes, this is a guy that's got top five quarterback potential written all over him. And quite honestly, if he meets all of that potential, this is a guy that really has QB3 potential on him because of how much he rushes the football, how many touchdowns he gets on the ground, and if he can pick that up this year, he could really be a viable fantasy asset every single week for owners. But what about the bake sale? Is he a guy that we should be taking a look at a little bit later on in drafts? Now, I'm going to be completely honest with you, Headliner Nation. We keep our receipts here. If we make calls, we'll let you know because we want you to know that we're doing well. But if we mess up on calls, we own it because nobody's perfect, especially us, and we own those missed calls. And last year, we just screwed up with the Cleveland Browns outside of Nick Chubb. We love Nick Chubb. But we screwed up when it came to Odell Beckham Jr., when it came to David Njoku, Baker Mayfield, all of them. They were not that good last year. But with Baker Mayfield, I think there are some good things that you can take from it. And just because the overall body of work was, for the lack of a better word, awful, there are some points where you got to look at it and say, man, Baker Mayfield did do pretty well in certain areas. And there are those opportunities there in 2020 because he has so many options around him that this is a guy that, yeah, maybe he's not the QB4, QB5 that a lot of us thought he was last year, but he's a guy that definitely has quarterback one potential. And when I say quarterback one, I mean anywhere between one and 12 is a quarterback one, but more than likely a low end quarterback one. He's not going to touch Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson or Dak Prescott or even Josh Allen. But he could sneak into that low-end quarterback one quite easily because of all the weapons that they have there. Now, he did go deep pretty, he did go deep quite often last year, okay? He went balls deep quite often, as we like to say around here. He had 76 deep attempts, which was fifth in the league. He did complete 27 of those attempts, which was seventh, and he had 869 deep yards, which was 10th. Yeah, him and Odell Beckham Jr. were never really on the same page most of the time, but there were times where he would target Odell Beckham Jr. deep quite a bit. He would go downfield with him. Now, to start the year this year, they might be missing Jarvis Landry, but they've got a couple of guys that could end up stepping in. But when you've got guys like Kareem Hunt, when you've got guys like Nick Chubb, when you've got guys like Austin Hooper and David Njoku, even if they are missing Jarvis Landry to begin the year, Baker Mayfield still has more than enough weapons around him to really move the passing game forward. And you got a guy in Kevin Stefanski, the head coach now, that is going to help utilize some of Baker Mayfield's assets that we saw last year, because many of you might not know how well he did on play-action passes. Last year on play-action passes, he had 105 completions, which was third. He had 11 touchdowns, which was second. 1,000. 427 yards, which was third, and he averaged nine yards per attempt, which was six. Now, here is why this gets even more important for 2020. We saw Kevin Stefanski in 2019 really lean on Dalvin Cook in that running game while he was with Minnesota. There is a really good chance he's going to bring a lot of that same framework to Cleveland. And if he does, with an upgraded offensive line, okay, where they brought in some guys in the draft, and obviously the big signing, grabbing from the Tennessee Titans, Jack Conklin, 
who was a huge part of Derrick Henry rushing the football last year in Tennessee, this bodes well for Baker Mayfield because they're going to be running the football a lot with Nick Chubb. And you're even going to see him Kareem Hunt get some touches on the ground as well. So because teams are going to be biting on that run game, because they're going to be running the ball so often, on those play action attempts, if Baker Mayfield can continue to be this good on play action passes, there's going to be a lot more things open for him this year. And hopefully with Kevin Stefanski, they get a, they get a little bit more consistency in the play calling. Last year, you could see it. Kitchens was outside his comfort zone. He was not a head coach at all, not even close to it. And you could see it in his play calling and the way that the the game flow would just go back and forth. And he would try to, he tried to outsmart everybody. He didn't go with what their strength was. Kevin Stefanski, to me, is a lot smarter than that. He understands what their strengths are and he's going to utilize those to make Baker Mayfield better. And that's what I think we see this year. And that's why, more than likely, as as of right now, we're going to see a high-end quarterback, too. Because, again, they're going to be running the football a lot this year. Upgraded offensive line. You've got Nick Chubb. You've got Kareem Hunt. Use it. Run the ball. But with Baker Mayfield, I'm all right with that. I'm okay with that. Because he, if he can finish as a high QB, two, he's got more than enough weapons there that they're going to see a lot of one-on-one coverage. They're going to have to try and take care of both of those things. He's going to have more time to throw. This is setting up well for Baker Mayfield. And because in these in the play-action game and going deep, because he was a little bit better with that last year, that is where I think a lot of these things can come into play. He's just got to work on that accuracy and stop trying to force some of those balls. Baker Mayfield, definitely a guy that can reach high QB2 status this coming year. And because of such a great ADP, he could be an asset to fantasy owners at some point in time. Now, let's go ahead and skip over running backs. I want to talk about my wide receiver here first. And I've got Anthony Miller from the Chicago Bears. Absolutely loved Anthony Miller coming out of the draft. And to me, Anthony Miller could really set up well as one of the next really, really good slot wide receivers. One of those guys that has that quick burst that speed to win out of the slot quickly off of those routes, that is where I think he could be most effective. And in 2019, not that bad of a season. He did have 85 targets, 52 receptions, 656 yards, and two touchdowns. Two thousand and nineteen was kind of backwards though compared to two thousand and eighteen. His rookie season in two thousand and eighteen, he started off hot. He looked really, really good his rookie season in that first half of the year, but then he suffered a shoulder injury. And there were times in the second half of the season where Anthony Miller was trying to pop his arm back into socket in the middle of a game. It was a bad injury. He healed from it. But last year in 2019, instead of starting off fast and finishing slow, it was the other way around. He started off slow and finished off well. So what happened last season? Let's take a look at his per-game statistics in 2020. And there's specifically a stretch of games that we need to look at. Now, again, to begin the season, it wasn't great. I mean, one, one target, one target, three targets, three targets. And then in week five, he goes to seven, nine, back down to three, one, and two. So there was some inconsistencies to begin the year there. I mean, the first three games of the year, 0, 2, 15, well, actually first four games of the year, 0, 2, 15, 11. But then in those games, again, when he gets a little bit more targets, seven, nine, and three targets, he goes 52, 64, 67. And we go back down to one and two targets, he goes zero and seven. So he's definitely a guy, when you give him enough volume, he's going to do something with it. They just, at times last year, didn't give him enough volume. Was it play calling? Was it Mitchell Trubisky? What was it last year where Anthony Miller just couldn't perform? Well, towards the end of the season, when they finally started giving him a decent amount of volume, the dude performed. From week 11 through week 15 is really where Anthony Miller kind of kind of showed us what he could be capable of working out of the slot in Chicago. During that time, from week 11 to week 15, 52 targets, 33 33 receptions, 
431 yards and two touchdowns during that time frame. That was when Anthony Miller really showed us that he can be a productive wide receiver and a great compliment to Allen Robinson. But then again, look at it in weeks 15 and 16, two targets and one target. And the games in which Anthony Miller was getting a decent amount of targets, seven targets, 52 yards, nine targets, 64, three targets, 67. And then you come down to the stretch of the, of the season that we were talking about, 11 targets, 54, 977, 13, 140, 442, 15, 118. When he gets the targets, he gets the yards. But when you only target him a couple of times a game, you're not giving him enough volume to really be a dependable wide receiver. Now, I talked about Allen Robinson in my must-have wide receiver video that was released uh, a few days ago. I like Allen Robinson. I was actually kind of scared of this uh, of this offense for quite a while this offseason. And then when we were doing one of our podcasts, Full Chub, which you can find over on Patreon, we started to dig into it a little bit more. And Chris, Chris, Jake, and myself, we all talked about it in depth. And really, that's what conversation brought me to say, man... This team actually, uh, this team could actually end up being a lot better than what I thought. This offense could end up being a lot better than I thought. Now we can't gu- we can't guarantee anything with Nick Foles. I want to see Nick Foles be the starter, but with such a crazy off season right now, one in which could definitely definitely be a little different come training camp and whether or not Nick Foles really gets enough reps with no preseason games to become the starter. We're just going to kind of work off the the assumption that he's not going to be the starter and it might be Mitchell Trubisky. But even with Mitchell Trubisky, Guy saw volume last year. Now, it, it's a little bit off there, and I apologize that it doesn't line up accurately. But Allen Robinson led the, led the Bears last year with 154 targets. Now, it was Anthony Miller coming in at 85 targets, being third on the team, but Cohen was at 104 targets. Now, in my Allen Robinson video, I did discuss this a little bit more. And I said, Javon Wims, you know, he got uh, 39 targets. Taylor Gabriel got 48 targets, okay? These are guys are both gone. Trey Burton is another guy that's gone. He got 24 targets. So these are guys that are, excuse me, Javon Wims is not gone. However, hopefully they don't have to use him as much as they did last year. So some of those targets could end up floating to Anthony Miller. So when you look at what targets are being vacated and what could be available, Anthony Miller could potentially see if you take some of that work away from Tariq Cohen and you work Anthony Miller in the slot a little bit more and you work Cohen out of the backfield or on the other side of the field, it's it's not out of the realm of possibilities that Anthony Miller can get a little bit closer to 100 targets this year. Let's spread them out a little bit more consistently, though. Okay, Instead of having a stretch of the season where he gets double-digit targets in three out of five games, let's go ahead and say we're going to get him anywhere from six to eight targets all season long. And if you can do that, you've got Allen Robinson, which all teams are going to have to pay attention to on one side of the field. They've got Ted Ginn Jr. now. They've got a guy that can actually physically stretch the field. They didn't really have that last season. So now you've got him. And if with David Montgomery, they get a little bit more consistent with the run game, that could bring guys a little bit closer to the box. That's going to leave Anthony Miller quite a bit of room to roam in the middle of the field. And he is a guy that has that quick burst. He can win on those routes off of the line. He might not be the fastest straight line type of guy, but that's why I like him in the slot more because he can win those slot routes a lot better against corner, uh, against corners that are playing in the slot or against a linebacker if they need to move over and they get mismatched. There's a lot of things to do there. So Anthony Miller is a guy that if we see more consistency, we saw it last year, if you give the guy targets, he will produce. If you get the guy targets this year, he could be that second receiving option next to Anthony, or excuse me, next to Allen Robinson. Anthony Miller could be in line for closer to 100 targets. If you can work on that receiving percentage a little bit more and boost it up, he can get you probably a little bit closer to 65, 70 receptions. And then at that point, we're looking at a guy putting together closer to 900 receiving yards. And heck, if we can get him more towards five recept- or five touchdown receptions, this is a guy that becomes a weekly flex or wide receiver three play and half PPR and PPR leagues. Now, my tight end to talk about this here is a guy that was basically forgotten because he didn't play a whole lot. He played in one game last year, and that's Chris Herndon from the New York Jets. I don't like the New York Jets offense one 
bit. But this is what we know about the New York Jets. They are a cluster you-know-what. Not going to say it. If you've got kids watching, I don't want them to repeat it. They are a mess. They traded Jamal Adams, and C.J. Mosley has opted out. That defense lost their two best players very, very quickly. And because of that, they're going to have to throw the ball a little bit more. Now, the reason that I like Chris Herndon this year is because of the weapons that they have added. And let's talk about that here in a second. But it's, we're gonna, let's look at his 2018 stats. Again, he only played in one game last year. But he's back this year looking healthy and ready to go. 56 targets, 39 receptions, 502 yards, and four touchdowns. That was his rookie season. Not bad rookie numbers for a tight end. Tight ends typically don't produce very well in their rookie season. He was not bad at all. And in fact, rookie tight end since 2010... He had 56 targets, which was the 18th most for any rookie since 2010. His 39 receptions were 13th most, and his 502 yards were 10th most among rookie tight ends since 2010. Since 2010, there's only been 10 rookie tight ends to have 500 or more yards, and he is one of them. So he had a pretty decent season his rookie year. Definitely going to give that to him. Now, the reason I'm liking Chris Herndon a little bit more this year is because more than likely they're not going to run a whole lot of four wide receiver sets. And because of that, you're going to see Chris Herndon on the field quite a bit. Chris Herndon doesn't strike me as a guy that's going to play in the slot too much, and they don't really need to. They've got Jamison Crowder there, who I absolutely love. On the outside, though, they've got Denzel Manzan and they've got Brashad Perryman. Now, bringing in Perryman was really big for this offense because they needed a field stretcher to replace Rodney Anderson, and they did that. Sam Darnold has a connection with Chris Herndon already, okay? He has that connection. They worked together in his rookie season when they were both rookies. So they've had that ability to work a little bit, which is good for him. So he kind of gets that leg up because Denzel Mims and Brashad Perryman are coming into an offense that, once again, you haven't had that big of an offseason. You're not going to have any rookie game or any, excuse me, you didn't have really a rookie training camp for Mims. You're not going to have any preseason games for these guys. So he might do what's most comfortable for him, for Sam Darnold. That offensive line probably isn't going to be that great either. So he's going to be getting the ball away quite a bit really quick. And that's where Jameson Crowder and Chris Herndon come in on those intermediate to short routes. These are guys that can win those intermediate to short routes. And because more than likely they're going to be passing the ball quite a bit, Chris Herndon is a guy that could really be in line for a huge bump in targets from his rookie season. This is a guy that could see more along the lines of 70, 75 targets. In fact, I would not be surprised if you look at targets at the end of the season, if you don't see Perryman, or if you don't see Jamison Crowder at one, maybe Perryman slips in at two, maybe it's Le'Veon Bell, but Chris Herndon might be like that three guy because he's going to have that comfort level with Sam Darnold. That's why I like him there. They've got a guy to stretch the field. They've got a running back that even though he wasn't great last year, you still got to respect him. Opposing defenses are still going to have to respect Le'Veon Bell's ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. Now, we might not respect it as fantasy owners that much because this offense is going to suck. They're going to be behind. They're not going to be able to run the ball as much as we would like. Le'Veon Bell, to me, is not a guy I'm investing in. But opposing defenses are still going to have to keep an eye on him. Game plans from opposing defensive coordinators are not going to leave Le'Veon Bell out. Okay, So they're still going to be looking at him. So you got to respect Perryman deep. you got to respect Le'Veon Bell in the backfield. you got Jamison Crowder, who's going to work over the middle of the field quite well. And then, obviously, on the outside, you're going to have cornerbacks that are going to be focused on Mims and Perryman. So... That's going to give Chris Herndon an opportunity to win against some linebackers. And he's athletic enough to win against those guys, especially if they're those linebackers that really aren't that great in coverage. Chris Herndon can be open quite a bit this season. If he can stay healthy, he is definitely a guy that has high tight end two written all over him. And because tight ends can be a mess at times, if he scores a touchdown in any week, he's likely a tight end one in that week. So he's got some tight end one upside in him as well. So make sure you're keeping an eye on Chris Herndon. Probably not a guy that you're drafting right now, but in season after your draft, keep an eye on him. Keep him on your watch list. And if you have issues at the position, you can grab him. Now let's talk about my running backs. And I've already talked about these running backs on a video before. 
And it's Ronald Jones and Darius Geis. And yeah, I know, I know. Jake hates Ronald Jones. Hashtag say no to Rojo has been a thing at the fantasy headliners for three years now. And I understand why. Ronald Jones has never really been that good. Darius Geis, you really haven't seen much out of him yet. But in terms of third-year running backs, there's not much to be excited for. You've got Saquon Barkley. He's Saquon Barkley. He's good to go. You've got Nick Chubb. He's good to go. But really, other than that, you don't have a whole lot of third-year running backs that are in the position that Ronald Jones and Darius Geis are in. Both of these guys, if they play well and limit mistakes and are not injured, they're going to be the guys that could really be looked at as being the lead back in those offenses. You know, with Ronald Jones, Bruce Arians did come out this past week and and gave him a vote of confidence and said he is our starting running back. LaShawn McCoy is here to help. Ronald Jones is our guy. He is going to be the main back. Now, Bruce Arians is known for feeding us some BS in the past, especially when it comes to the run game. I mean, essentially, in most weeks, he was splitting carries between Ronald Jones and Peyton Barber last season, who's god-awful. So, yes, being apprehensive about Ronald Jones, 100%, I get it. But he's a guy that's going in, like, the 6th or the 7th round right now. If you go running back heavy, if you get your two, maybe three running backs to start, you get a couple of wide receivers, maybe your quarterback or your tight end, depending on if you're waiting, you know, you get to that sixth or seventh round and you're looking for a running back three, a running back four, you could do a lot worse than Ronald Jones, I believe. Because to me, Ronald Jones will start as the main guy. He will be the starting running back to begin the season. Now, after he starts the season, that's when things get interesting. If he can't bass block, if he's, I mean, if he's dropping passes, if he's not finding holes, if he's just not playing well, then Ronald Jones is going to see his job decrease, 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 decrease until, he, until it becomes nothing. Okay, basically that's what what it's going to be. So, am I drafting him as my running back too? Absolutely not. But if I'm getting him as my three or my four, you know, if you end up hitting on that pick. Who knows what could happen? That could be big for you down the stretch. And with Darius Geis, this is a guy, I talked about Ronald Jones and Darius Geis and my dynamic running back rating. It's a video I did a few weeks back. It's got Devin Singletary on the cover of it. So if you're looking for more in-depth information on these two guys, go back to that video. And if you want to watch it, let me know in the comments. I'll link it in the comments if you respond and let me know you want to see it. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll put it in there. But the dynamic running back rating is a rating that I developed that lets us see the upside in all players on a per game and per touch basis, not a full season basis. Because like we say here at the Fantasy Headliners a lot, you can't just look at those top layer numbers. You got to dig deep. You got to find things that can really help tell a story about a player and his fantasy value coming up in any given season. And that's what this dynamic running back rating does. Jones and Geis both have favorable per-touch ratings in the dynamic running back rating. Ones that, to me, can predict a potential breakout. Last year, we predicted with this rating, we predicted breakouts for Aaron Jones. We predicted breakouts for Derrick Henry. There were some other guys, too, that we were like, and Nick Chubb was another one. We are like, you got to get these guys because they could be excellent. And that rating did very well for us because it predicted those breakouts last year. So if Ronald Jones and Darius Geis get the volume, they're both guys that can break out. And with Darius Geis in the dynamic running back rating, I have 10 years worth of data that I pulled. When I was developed this rating, I pulled 10 years worth of data to see how it looked in years past. Darius Geis has the highest per-touch ratings I have ever pulled in this rating. It's absolutely insane. It's in the draft guide, the dynamic back, the dynamic running back rating in the draft guide. I break down every single team. I talk about Darius guys. So if you're interested in seeing more of that, 1999 at thefantasyheadliners.com, you can get yours. And again, my dynamic running back rating exclusive content, you can't get it anywhere else. You can find in there. With Darius guys on a per-touch basis, absolutely fantastic. He just has to stay healthy. That's all there is to it. If he stays healthy, he beats out AP and touches. 100%, it happens. So Darius guys to me, is someone I actually want to invest in over Ronald Jones. Because Darius Geis is is really good. <laughs> That's the difference. Darius Geis is really good. Ronald Jones, we're not 100% sure yet. He shows flashes at times, but he's far too inconsistent. And he just, 
you know, there's just something about him that when you watch Ronald Jones play, you're like, dude, you just missed a gigantic hole on the left side. Or, you know, you could have went up the you could have went up the sideline there and gained 10 more yards, and instead you cut it back right into a defender. Like, there's things on tape that you see with Ronald Jones that just make you shake your head and, and put your head down. With Darius Geis, though, his tape is excellent. I mean, he is a big-time running back. He's just got to stay healthy. That's all there is to it. And again, if you want to see that dynamic running back video that I did, it's just a snippet of what you see in the draft guide, kind of a teaser. So you can check it out and see it for yourself. And again, you can get our draft guide at thefantasyheadliners.com. It gives you the breakdown for all running backs on all 32 teams, in-depth write-ups of them, and the scores as well. And there you have it, Headliner Nation, my breakout candidates for their third year in the league for 2020 so again do me a favor down in the comments below let me know who your breakouts are and if you want me to link you to that video i'll do it in the comments if you leave me one hit that like button for me and as always if you're new to headliner nation hit that subscribe button if this is your first time checking out one of our videos become a part of our awesome community here and stick around for more in-depth content there you have it headliner nation i am out enjoy the video enjoy all the content and i'll catch you on the next episode stay safe stay healthy Love y'all. I'll see you later.